Welcome to Disruption Blueprint with Shannon Spotswood from RFG Advisory. In this podcast, we help advisors grow their net worth, build their businesses, and maximize their independence. We've built an award-winning platform with innovative technology, comprehensive service, and a team of individuals who are experts in their field to serve advisors. Join us for this journey where we explore everything that has to do with running an independent advisor practice as we bring together successful advisors, industry experts, and innovative minds who are on the bleeding edge to challenge the status quo, foster new ideas, and create a path for advisors to unleash their growth potential. Now, on to the show. Laura, it is so great to be with you today. Thank you for joining us on War Room Huddle. Thank you for having me. I've been really looking forward to our discussion. I feel like we've been planning this. Uh, We're obviously kicking off Breast Cancer Awareness Month, so we're here in our power pink. Yes, we are. Uh, So it is. um, It's going to be a really special session. You've um, you've been an advisor for a long time, and yes, I think of you as part of this amazing group of women who were, you know, in all, you know, in all honesty, the best word is trailblazing. Thank you. (laughs) Trailblazing in the industry. And you've paved the way for people like me and the women who are younger than I am. Uh, And I think we've all enjoyed this incredibly vibrant career with several different chapters. So first question, how does it feel to be called a trailblazer? Ooh, well, um, I think it's a compliment. And, uh, you know, things back when I began the business uh, in 1985, um, it was predominantly men. And I I wasn't really sure how that was going to work out on my behalf. But um, everyone was very nice and accepting. And um, boy, but I had to work hard. And I wanted to make sure that you know, I was working hard as any male counterpart and that I was doing and what I needed some. to do. And then some, <laughs> yes. And I think women do that. I think they work harder than men on, on most occasions. <laughs> we'll keep that as a secret. Yes, yes. <laughs> Don't tell anyone. Don't tell anyone. Yes. So you started your career at Mass Mutual. So talk yes. about what got you into the business and why did you start there? Uh, well, I have to go back to my family and how I grew up, and my mom and dad uh, raising my sister and I, and um, you know we we really grew up in a middle income kind of lower class family. My mother and father worked very hard, and you know they struggled. I I didn't realize that until we were a little older when we were in college, and um, I just knew that I didn't want to be in that situation. My parents loved us so much, and they, my sister and I went to college. That was something that she and I both wanted to do, and we were able to do this by, um, you know, scholarships and, and loans, student loans, and we made it and got through it, but um, I, I just knew that there was something else. Like, I started my career path as an educator, and I was um, a teacher of the hearing impaired, and <laughs> I quickly knew that even though it was a wonderful thing to do, that that was not really where I wanted to go with my career. And I wanted to be able to be financially free, have that freedom and the ability to uh, provide for my family and do more things. And I wanted to help people. So I decided to get into the insurance business. That was the only thing that I knew at the time that would lead me there. So I did, and I started working with Mass Mutual. And the first, I remember going in, and the first, uh, they said, the first 90 days, we'll take a look at you, and you take a look at us. We're not sure if you're a good fit for this kind of business, but um, we'll let you know after 90 days. And I said, okay, fine. So, boy, you know, went in there and just worked really hard, and determination was the key there, just to be determined that you were going to be successful in uh, keeping your nose down and doing the things that you knew you had to do to get through. So you made it through the 90 days, and how many years did you spend Uh, at Mass Mutual? 28 years later, uh, I was still there. So 28 years in, at that point, most people would be like, check, done. This is where I'm going to spend the rest of my career. Yes. But you had 
the you know heard the siren song of independence. I so did. talk about the that process because there's a lot of advisors that are building advisory practices within insurance chassis right. and and curious about independence. Yes, uh, that's kind of where I was because Mass Mutual was uh, more or less experimenting at the time with uh, financial planning and. They provided um, uh, mutual funds and some limitations with respect to where to invest invest money. Uh, however, I had uh, in this process of getting out of the necessarily all insurance and realizing that I wanted to do more planning and be engaged with people more and talk about their goals and their kids' education and, and other things that they wanted to accomplish. I really wanted to be a part of that process. And and so I, I got my um, chartered financial consultant designation and other uh, securities licenses to so that I could actually charge a fee to do that. So I, I began that par, uh, process, rather, and then I realized that I'm still at Mass Mutual and it's an insurance company and I need to do something differently. Um, it was almost limiting in some ways. So in 2013, I started uh, talking to another RIA at the time that really just did wealth management and financial planning. Mm-hmm. And I knew I needed to do something different. And Lord knows, I don't know how this happened. I just remember this quote from Abraham Maslow that said, you can go back to safety or you can move forward towards growth. And growth has to be chosen time and time again. And fear has to be overcome time and time again. So wow. I, I just, I, you know, I just had to keep thinking that, thinking that. And then, you know, I said, okay, I'm doing it. May the 1st of 2013, I made that move. And um, just went right into this new RIA environment. May 1st is my birthday, so I've oh, always considered it to be the most wonderful yes, day of the year. Of and course. now that I know that that's your Independence yes, Day, Independence Day, we're going to toast our I glasses and drink some champagne yes, uh, next yes. May uh, go around. That's a beautiful quote. Thank you. How do you continue, you know, that, that's so, it's, those are such powerful words. And, you know, you're obviously a Stronger Money ambassador. We'll talk a little bit about that. But so much of Stronger Money <coughs> is around empowering women to live financially fearless through education. Right. And one of our founding quotes for Stronger Money is, everything you want is on the other side of fear. And your quote is, you know, growth has to be chosen time and time again. Fear has to be overcome time and time again. How do you live that quote today? How does it inform who you are today as an advisor? Well, I, I think that, um, you know, today when, when you don't have other things, uh, challenges in life and things are routine, right? And you, you kind of get in this uh, comfortable place then I think uh, that's when I try to bring that to the surface and remember that we're all still growing and I need to apply that concept to growth instead of uh, being mediocre. I really don't want to be mediocre. I could have stayed at Mass Mutual and done that, even though Mass Mutual, I would say, provided me a great opportunity. But for me, it just was something I wanted to do differently. So I think that growth aspect of it if you keep that in the forefront of your of your mind that that propels you to always think of what can I do to grow if it's spiritual or yeah. if it's professionally or whatever you um you're really walking the walk on this and I want to dig in before you joined RFG you got really close to signing a deal that would have resulted in you becoming more of a w2 employee and giving up your independence as you think back to that time and you ultimately made the decision to partner with us and, and we're going to talk about um, some really exciting work that you're doing with your new branding and, and the future that you're, that you're forging. But what is your advice to advisors who are standing on that precipice where you have a very good choice, a W-2, you know, a different kind of take on partnership and ownership 
and having full control over your destiny. What advice do you mm-hmm. offer them as you look through yeah. that that yeah. backwards lens? Yeah, I, well, I think you have to be careful um, where you're going with that. Um, when I joined a firm, uh, this RIA, it was very independent. And then it became more and more kind of tight and where, oh, we're thinking about W-2 income and um, and there's partner uh, opportunities. And if you if you become a partner, you have to sign non-disclosure agreements. And, uh, and, and Which is very industry standard it, it, for it, that it, model. Yes, it and is. And you'll find that replicated yes. in multiple different forums. Correct. And it... It, it really works for some advisors. It does, but for me it didn't. Right. <laughs> but because, you're right, uh, it's scary because years ago when I decided that this was the path I wanted to take, the most important thing was independence. Mm-hmm. I wanted to uh, really work for myself. Um, and when someone starts dictating your pathway, um, it, it brings back some concern So I didn't want to be a W-2 employee. I didn't want to sign a non-compete disclosure where if I were asked to leave or if I had to leave, wanted to leave, then, you know, I I wouldn't be able to call on my clients for two years. Right. So that's a very scary situation. And so, yeah, I think you have to be careful for, I think, most people in this industry – that I think there's opportunity for independence, and there's a reason behind that. Well, we certainly believe it as we've built all of RFG's platform around how to amplify advisor independence to help drive enterprise value. Yes. And and you're really sitting at the tip of the spear of that. You've recently yeah. forged a partnership with uh, another Stronger Money ambassador, Chris Waddell, And you've not only formed a partnership as you're thinking about kind of how does one plus one not equal three, how does one plus one equal 11? This is, in my mind, if I was to describe your partnership, this is a really the the perfect example of force multiplication and being a force multiplier. So you you recognize that you want to have... um, you know, you're starting the beginning of the next chapter and you want it to be a very vibrant one. And this business affords the opportunity to work with clients for you know a long time. And I think we're all starting to rethink longevity. And what does that mean for us, not only in our own lives, but for our clients? So you and Chris have come together and forged this partnership. And tell us about the name of your new firm. And why you've made this decision. Because you could have very easily continued on for the next 15 years as an independent advisor, serving your clients, growing your practice. Yeah, well, it, a couple of things. Um, number one, I, I realized that um, and it, it was a process. It doesn't just happen overnight. That I really didn't want to do this forever. I enjoy what I do. But at 70... I, I can tell you I, I don't want to be doing this. Not that it's a lovely, it's been a lovely career. It's just the responsibility, and, um, and, and I love my clients. So I was always um, kind of going back and forth as to what to do because uh, for a long time I could see myself doing this at 70. But I want to do something at 70, and it may be still financially involved, but as far as the responsibility of this day to day, day to day, I, I wanted to do something. So, um, RFG, Shannon, you were so key in having us think about this process. And once again, it was a process uh, because I can identify several people, but I wanted to make sure that whoever we identified, they had the bandwidth to take care of my clients. Just think, as I mentioned, I've known these people. I even hate to call them clients. They're people I really care about. And, you know, so I want to make sure that they're taken care of if I die today. Or if, you know, I at some point 
do say, I'm done, I'm retired now. And this ease of joining with Chris and finding that right fit was perfect. You know, Chris and I have a, a lot of the philosophy that we have is the same. Yep. For example, um, she, for the most part, we like planning first and then making our recommendations. Otherwise, how are we going to know what recommendations to make for our clients and what's best for them? So we had that same philosophy. We had other things that were common. Um, we enjoy working out. We enjoy being active. We enjoy traveling. So our new DBA, Valer Wealth Advisors, came from Chris taking time just to write down words that were meaningful to her and me doing the same thing and then us merging those together and coming up with a common name. And it, it happened to be Valer, which means to fly or soar. And that was I mean, a good match. It gives match. me chills when you tell the story. Yeah, that was <laughs> such a good match for us and our team. And now our team, I feel like we're not both on islands, but we're together with the same common interest. Yep. Um, and our team is wonderful. We have four or five in our team now. And, uh, and I, I just, this can continue to grow or not. Uh, I just think it's a great opportunity. So you know we have a succession crisis in the industry, and you've oh. really tackled this head-on with your partnership with Chris. And I can already read the tea leaves on this one. You two are going to be, you know, force multipliers, and it's going to be a really exciting couple of years for you and for your clients and for stronger money. Why do you think it is that we have a succession crisis? Why are we pinned at about 15% of advisors have taken the steps that you've taken and gone through and done the emotional work that you've done to identify a partner and then actually put in place a plan so that you can have optionality about what your next chapter looks like? Well, I, I think that in, in I, I would think, yes, in most cases, um, that people don't really know where to go or how to proceed they feel, I think, generally speaking, kind of stuck or um, they think about it, but they really don't s spend the time they need to do. And I would say um, when I came to you, you just automatically knew what to do. We need to do this and that, and um, you need to think about this or whatever was important at the time when we were discussing yeah. this. And, you know, I thought, oh, well, this is, this was easier than, than I thought. So, um, it, uh, so I think that understanding, getting together with someone that has the knowledge and, has, and, and, and is able to put pieces together for you. Does that make sense? Absolutely. You know, like, so you can just kind of wallow around, waller around and not do anything whatsoever. And guess what? Nothing changes. <laughs> and all of a sudden, you're 70 years old, and nothing's changed. Yeah. So um, I read the other day that the average age for financial advisors is between 50 and 55. So, Well, yeah. and it's interesting because most of the studies that I've read is would put that number north of 60. Really? Yeah. Oh, my. It's even worse than I thought. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Um, so succession planning and understanding, having a spot that has the ability to make good matches for you, uh, because, you know, that's a process too. Right. finding out who that individual, the deal, we always say the deal is the easiest part of yes. this. Like we can structure deals oh, all yeah. day long. Give me a whiteboard and right. a, you know, right. an eraser and we'll figure out what works for both parties. Right. It's the chemistry. It is the chemistry is so important. Yeah. Because I've seen situations that aren't so good, but um, and I think that's just was people getting together and not having a, a process or thinking through it before they. Well, and I think part of it is not being open and vulnerable. Yes. I mean, you and Chris have really dug oh, in yeah. Yeah. and learned to have radical candor with each other. Oh, yeah. Learn that there is no benefit to holding back. 
your emotions That's and your true. feelings in this. I mean, these are your babies. These yes. are your businesses. You yes. poured your life into these. At no question. Building these client relationships and these practices. And to your point, they're not just clients. Right. Exactly. Like there is, that is one of the things I love so much about this industry is we are knit together. I don't care where you are, you know, wirehouse, insurance, to, you know, sitting on an, uh, in, in my seat working with independent advisors. We are knit together by our call to serve. Absolutely. And so it is so important to kind of get to the, the guts of that emotional conversation. And, you know, we, f- we found, um, I mean, we have a lot of respect for each other. We laugh a lot. We have fun. But we can be pretty candid with each other, too, and and be respectful. And I think that's a good combination. All right, stronger money. Why do you think stronger money is so important today? Well, um, wow. (laughs) I think that it's time that um, women step up to the plate and understand uh, what's going on with their financial situation uh, you remember, as you've mentioned, you know, I, it's, it's been a while, right, since I've been in this business. So when I first started, it was more the um, male who uh, said, I'm, it's my business and we'll let this. you know, you know, what, what you need to know. And, um, it, but funny thing, my mother always uh, was the one in our household that, took care of the finances, uh, and uh, I love that. Um, but I, I think that uh, wh- whoever it is, even if it's the other way around, both parties need to know what's going on because reality happens. One dies. Where's the deed to the house? What, what's my financial situation? Where's that bank account? Oh, my God, I need money. I need money to... Uh, to go to the grocery store or whatever, um, and, and where are the wheels? And do I have a power of attorney? My husband just had a stroke. Where's that power of attorney? Uh, oh, my, do, do we have it? Uh, so th- that's really the reasoning behind understanding and taking a vested interest for females to really get involved and getting involved in this business. I mean, the Stronger Money events are some of my absolute favorite events. I've been fun. Oh, so fun. I've been fortunate enough to do a couple of them with you and with Chris and a handful of our other Stronger Money ambassadors. And what always just strikes me about those events, one, the energy in the room is just like so through the roof. Like it's it's different than any other Yeah, we've been to a lot of client yes. events yes. and there's wonderful information to be conveyed and but there's something really special about women coming together and being proactive even if the question is you know very kind of timidly raising the hand and saying I I'm fill in the blank age I'm 55 I'm 65 I'm 70 years old and I haven't started saving for retirement what do I do now right. like there is so much power in kind of acknowledging and owning the elephant in the room and then partnering with a financial advisor at really every and any stage of your life of your financial you know balance sheet cultivation I, I walk away from every one of those events and I just think, oh my gosh, we need to do a hundred more of these, a thousand more of these, 10,000. We need a conference. Uh, that's true. And I think a lot of that, Shannon, is because people feel uh, relaxed and safe in that environment because there's been so many times when um, you're afraid to ask a question and you're afraid that it's going to sound stupid or... Uh, Maybe you don't really know what you're talking about. And I think women tend to hold questions in a lot. And I think this environment that we create is fun and full of excitement, as you mentioned. And then it is a safe environment. So one of my goals for 2023 is to host a Stronger Money conference. Oh. Ooh, I like that. So we're gonna have to Exciting. get in the we're gonna have to get in the lab and do some cooking on that yes. that idea. Love that. All right, we're gonna switch gears, and this is something you've never talked about in mm. a public forum. Well, it is one of your first podcasts, but this is very personal to you. You are a two-time 
breast cancer survivor. Yes. Which is amazing. <laughs> Thus our Thank pink. you. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> you are one of the most formidable fundraisers in the state of Alabama, raising money for be- breast cancer awareness and research. Congratulations. Thank You're you. consistently honored for the work that you do on behalf of that. How has that experience shaped you as an advisor? Um, well, you know, first and foremost, I have to go back and think about how it shaped my life. And um, I just remember uh, getting the news and um, thinking that that's not something that happens to me. It happens to someone else. Uh, but it did, it did happen to me. And in 2013, um, uh, I had made that move, remember, May 1st yeah. to the new RIA. And on June the 13th, that's bam, I get this news and I'm like devastated. Wow, what have I done? This, I've just went out to my independence and I'm not, I don't have company uh, health insurance anymore. It's all provided by whatever I bought. And um, um, in, in, fortunately, my disability came over with me in case I needed that. So all these wheels started turning. And, you know, I was determined, Shannon, that it wasn't going to change my life after I had a plan in place, which that's the really scariest thing, you know, until you have that plan and you can work the plan. And someone says, well, you got to go through it to get through it. And yeah. and that's so true in life, whatever that challenge might be. So I kept that in my mind and had a good mindset as to what I wasn't going to do. I was going to still continue to go for my jogs or maybe slash walks now. I was going to continue to work out. Maybe it wasn't 50 pounds. Maybe it was 25 pounds. I was I was going to continue to work and um, – and then uh, be more involved, involved, really, quite frankly, spiritually. I think uh, all those things together, um, it wasn't just me. It was my team and uh, of all the things I've mentioned. And then that helped me move forward into applying some of those things in my work life. So um, instead of stressing so much, uh, which you tend to do in this business, uh, it was, well, let me, um, let me think about how I can apply some of those concepts to my work life. And I think that's what I did. So keep going down that path. Cause I, I think there's a lot of advisors out there who can relate to that. We are inundated on a daily basis by factors we can't control yes. market volatility, interest rates, you know, you fill in the blank. We right. can't control any of that. So as, you know, as you applied these, these very deep lessons that you were learning in real time and learned to let go of that stress, how does, how does an advisor do that that doesn't have to walk the path of, I need to be a two times breast cancer survivor to learn these lessons? Well, I I think it has to be intentional. I think that you have to, um, spend some quiet time in reflection. And um, I hate to say this, but it's it's also about the people you surround yourself with. Power of five. Yes. <laughs> and um, uh, nutrition. Um, and if you're spiritual, prayer. Uh, and just asking for guidance as to how can I get centered in your mindset so sometimes when I get off, which does happen, and I'm just really stressed about a situation, if I can just leave and go for a walk and just think about nothing, if I can, just go for a walk, get away from the situation so then you can have a better perspective. If you're upset about something, let a day or two pass before you respond to whatever it is you need to respond to. I think that um, some of those things have really helped me. It's great advice, yeah. whether you're an advisor or yes. a mother or yeah. a oh. spouse or, I mean, in, a friend. I mean, I think that the um, one of the great disservices of our kind of always connected communication is that there's no room for grace in that. 
we feel this need to have a con you know oh, wow. respond react. react yes and um you know that learning that discipline <clears throat> skill of let me marinate on this let me think about it let me come back when i've processed it as opposed to being reactive is is a, is is going to become a skill that we have to re reclaim it is and relearn a, oh my gosh it is such the skill uh, i remember that was a fault um, of just being reactive in yeah. the past and so it was definitely a learn okay so this is um this is kind of a crazy concept that you and I have talked about and it's on the back of some podcasts that we've listened to and some articles we've read and this is a little bit getting in the weeds of the technicals of financial planning um, but we, we we talked about how there is a just a tremendous amount of money being put into longevity research and medical research for longevity and there's been work done in the financial planning space. And we all know that we build these financial plans in our Monte Carlo analysis and the actuarial tables are guiding those, you know, those numbers. Um, but there has been some interesting, and it's not hardcore evidence, it's more anecdotal evidence, that when you build financial plans that no longer have you dying at, say, 85, but dying at 100, and you present both to a client and you come back to them six months later that the client is making lifestyle changes because now they've oriented in their brain, I want to live to 100. And there's all kinds of interesting implications from that for our industry. One is the fear. I'm going to run out of money, so we can't build plans that are going to last to 100 because I'm assuming I'm retiring. So where am I going to develop this next pool of money? Number two is just health and overall wellness. Do I really want to live to 100? But the you know kind of silver lining for our industry is that if we extend the life of our clients and if they are living that next you know chapter in a very vibrant way that instead of being in drawdown sooner from retirement we're actually in accumulation phase longer which means the ROI you know hate to be kind of black and white about it the ROI on that client is higher what do you think about that i mean you've been studying financial planning for a long time and yeah. thinking about longevity for a long time your clients your own your own succession plan what do you think about that? Well, I, you know, that that's such an interesting concept and um, a new one. And, and listening to some of the podcasts that address that is pretty interesting. And today, um, being just an advisor, I don't know. I think you got to be more. So I think a good start for people going down this path possible path comes from us like you mentioned putting this idea into their head so let's not plan on age 80 <laughs> let's look at 95 let's look at 100 what is that going to really take yeah and i think if you help people see that then they're more willing to um i don't know they're they're more willing to plan on it um because I can see very clearly that if you say, okay, my father and my mother, um, you know, you hear that and, and they, they passed away early, uh, we're only going to plan to 80. Right. And I go, well, what if? Right. You know, there's no guarantee. Let's over plan instead of under plan. So then how does that lead you when you're having those conversations? Because the scariest part about that is, What's my purpose? How right. are you That's helping true. your clients as you think about stretching out that plan, you know, become more of a right. life coach, help, you know, reframe what is right. my purpose? Yeah. So I guess the old way of retiring is to retire, go home, put your feet up. And then all of a sudden you go, well, now what? what? <laughs> yeah, right. What do I do now? So just think about it. We've worked we were in school and college. We worked all of our lives, and now nothing. Yeah. So, I think you have to find 
uh, I think we have to help our clients find a purpose and meaning. So once again, I think this concept is going to go further. And I think we're at the very beginning stages of making this happen. I think so too. I think this is a really, really exciting it frontier. Is. Yes. And it's going to be, uh, in fact, um, I think I'm going to start working on this as soon as I can. You got a three week vacation. Yes. Maybe when you're tootling around France, you That's can right. uh, think about this. And I only have the three week vacation because I know of my team. That's there in right. case something happens. I mean, this is the first time you're doing this. You're taking a three-week yes. vacation. Yes. It can be done. Yes. Someone actually said to me after, because I took a you know week off yeah. and completely digitally unplugged right. it back in 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 March for spring break with my kids. And I was t- you know sharing the story with someone, and they said, you know, that's actually the best test you can do of your leadership and the resiliency within your team. And then said differently for an advisor, it's the best way to test your success succession plan. Have you built a firm that can't work without you? You've got to be involved in every little decision. Like if your team can't survive without you for a week or three weeks, something is wrong. Right. Like it's not a badge of honor that you have to be there every day. Like you have failed yourself and your team, if that's the truth. Absolutely. I think Dan Sullivan back years ago, um, he is strategic coach, gentleman, and he, uh, I think you had to mark your calendar off, and I cannot remember the what he actually called it. But there were there were days that you did not do anything from a work perspective. You know, you didn't answer the phone, you went away, you didn't look at your email or do anything towards that. And I think you experienced that for an entire week. Yep. And I think sometimes uh, for me. Uh, I, You know, you kind of have to work on your ego because it's like, oh, they can't do this without me. That is so wrong. Uh, They're very well equipped to do it without you, believe me. Uh, So um, just giving that up. Yeah, it really is a lot about the ego. All right, last question. We are pinned at about 14% of financial advisors are women. And yet, you know, show me the soapbox. I will crawl on top of it and shout (laughs) about what a great profession and industry this is for women. Um, But we're not doing a great job of attracting young women. And there are so many different facets of our business from financial advisor, marketing, compliance, operations, the legal side. I mean, there's just so many different um, avenues for women to pursue. Why? Why now, 2022, almost 2023, do we still have a problem attracting women to be financial advisors? To me, it's like the most, as a hedge fund girl, investment banker, former investment banker, former hedge fund manager, wow. I'm like, yeah. I should have been a financial advisor. Oh, goodness, I know. I, you know, that puzzles me as well. It doesn't make a lot of sense. But I do think that uh, some things that we could do as a financial industry, you know, we could go to colleges and universities across, and um, not only the ones that have financial planning as maybe a degree, but in, in the finance area, and we could talk about becoming a financial advisor, what that takes. Now, they're not going to have a book of business. Right. But they can come into the industry and work as a client services representative, perhaps. And then get to know the business, work for a couple of advisors, see what they do, as well as start uh, maybe learning and uh, getting your CFP, taking some courses, some coursework. And then, um, boy, remember that stat. You know, I said 50 to 55. You said older 60s of advisors retiring What a wonderful thing for women, because women are, and I'm generalizing, I realize that, but are good listeners. Right. I think they work hard. We all, we, they, we, yeah, <laughs> work hard. Uh, we have empathy, and and not to say males don't, but I think we're good at that. Um, and 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 so, oh, lastly, it's having the flexibility, right? Because if you have children. Uh, goodness, you know, you can work around that. I knew a couple of colleagues in the past from Mass Mutual who 
uh, got in about 8.30, and they were out by 2.30, and they were so for focused during that time frame. Right. Uh, so it's a wonderful opportunity, but I, I do think that we have to do a better job perhaps communicating this opportunity in the maybe we need to cook up a um like as part of our stronger money ambassadors program we do a a college outreach oh good idea and just talk about the industry absolutely Uh, we have to do something test we have to do we we have to be intentional and and, you know schwab and fidelity and the custodians are really they're creating programs to do this cfp board you know there's a lot of work but i just still feel like there's work to be done i agree Laura, thank you so much. Thank you, Shannon. Loved having you in the in War Room Huddle. Enjoyed it. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you for listening to the Disruption Blueprint podcast. Click the follow button to be notified when new episodes become available. Visit our website at www.rfgadvisory.com or schedule a call on our advisor resources page. And don't forget to click the follow button to be notified when new episodes become available. Content here is for illustrative purposes and general information only. It is not legal, tax, or individualized financial advice, nor is it a recommendation to buy, sell, or hold any specific security or engage in any specific training strategy. Information here may be provided in part by third-party sources. These sources are generally deemed to be reliable. However, neither our guests nor RFG advisory guarantee the accuracy of third-party sources. The views expressed here are those of our guest. They do not necessarily represent those of RFG Advisory, its employees, or its clients. This commentary should not be regarded as a description of advisory services provided by RFG Advisory or performance returns of any client. The views reflected in the commentary are subject to change at any time without notice. Securities offered by registered representatives of private client services, member FINRA SIPC. Advisory services offered by investment advisory representatives of RFG Advisory, a registered investment advisor. Private client services and RFG Advisory are unaffiliated entities. Advisory services are only offered to clients or prospective clients where RFG Advisory and its representatives are properly licensed or exempt from licensure. No advisory services may be rendered by RFG Advisory unless a client agreement is in place. RFG Advisory is an SEC-registered investment advisor. SEC registration does not constitute an endorsement of RFG by the Commission, nor does it indicate that RFG or any associated investment advisory representative has attained a particular level of skill or ability.